Coming up on Theater Talk. Today, there are no producers in the sense that there were. There was one producer, and you know, if, if the show won the Tony, the one producer would get up. Now it's a small village. Good for your business, though, too. If they have a luncheon meeting, there are, well, instead of four of them, there are 20 of them. That's right. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. City, this is Theater Talk. I'm producer Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So Michael, I often use superlatives when describing guests, but I have to say I am heartfelt when I say we have one of the most talented young playwrights in America on our show today. Yes, indeed. Uh, Amy Herzog has a new play called Belleville at uh, the New York Theater Workshop. She is the favorite playwright of Charles Isherwood, our friend at the New York Times, who's really made that career. Well, I think Amy <laughs> Herzog kind of, made that Isn't career. it nice, Amy, to have someone like Charles Isherwood on, on your side? It's like uh, what, uh, I don't know, what Brooks Atkinson was for Eugene O'Neill. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> I, I am very aware of how lucky I am. Yeah. Now, what was the first play that you did that Charles reviewed where suddenly your life changed? That was After the Revolution in 2010, which is my big family drama with eight characters that went up at Playwrights Horizons. Mm -hmm. And he called it smart and engrossing. Which was really nice. And, and right on the money, too, right? <laughs> That's now, right. I'm curious, though. Tell me what it's like. You're a young playwright, and this is the first one. Uh, the New York Times comes. Are you... You, do, you don't know much about Charles Isherwood. Are you nervous? I mean, your career could begin or end with one thing that this man has to say about your play. Do you remember when you got the review, when you first saw it, when you read it? That yeah, I was in the cab on the way uh, driving home from the opening night party, and my husband uh, brought it up on his phone and read it out loud to me. I've since stopped reading all reviews, actually, so that was, I think, the last one that I had that kind of uh, really, really direct engagement with. Did you Why cry? Did, did you jump, jump up and down? Did you well, I just remember house? there was one paragraph that was somewhat critical, and I remember saying, that's true. That's true. I remember thinking, this is fair. It's a really good review. I really lucked out. And, uh, and the things that he's pointing out that were problematic, I, they're fair. And then, and then suddenly, do all agents come running after you, offers pour in, theaters chase you for your next one because you've got the review in the Times? You know, I don't remember it happening exactly like that. I had already written 4,000 Miles, which is sort of the sequel play, mm -hmm. or not really sequel, but a, a companion piece to After the Revolution, and it was already slated to be produced at LCT3, so that was already in motion. Um, and I'm sure more opportunities started opening up, commissions and that kind of thing, but I don't remember it being quite the the you know the watershed moment maybe that you're describing mm, well I'm, I'm old-fashioned Broadway the old <laughs> Sardis days when you know they would get the early edition of the times and stand on a chair or on a table read the rave I've or heard a, you know my grandmother worked in the theater and I've heard her describe that and oh, I, what did she I do? sort of wish we, we had that she was a production assistant she worked she was Mary Martin's private secretary for many years she worked for the group theater she had an affair with John Garfield I'm happy oh, to say on oh television my God, wow. now was your <laughs> was your grandmother on the side of your family that were the the Marxists this is the very this grandmother that after written. the revolution and 4,000 miles uh, that is based about, on. Right? Oh, I see. Interesting. So you're uh, theatrical royalty almost. <laughs> well, I guess if you're related to a production assistant, you are theatrical royalty. Yeah. <laughs> they know where all the bodies are works. buried. <laughs> uh, now tell us a bit about uh, uh, Belleville. What, um, give us a sense of what the, the, the play's about for people who haven't seen it and what um, got you thinking about tackling this uh, subject. Sure. It's very different from my earlier plays about my family. Uh, and I, I feel sometimes like I need to warn people who know my earlier work that this is a big, uh, it's sort of a, a big left turn. Uh, it's a scary play. It's a play about a couple, about a marriage, a couple in their 20s, and their marriage is sort of on the rocks and fraying in ways that become apparent as the play progresses. They're in Belleville, which is a neighborhood, a very vibrant, interesting neighbor neighborhood in Paris, mm -hmm. there for about a year. Um, and so they're very isolated from home and from friends and family, and it's in that kind of pressure cooker environment that things start to get exciting. Start to unravel. Right. Um, based on... <laughs> your own marriage when you were living in France with your husband? <laughs> exactly. I'm also based on my grandmother. No, it's uh, yeah, I, there's a really famous story of a man named Jean-Claude Ramon, who is French, which is part of the reason I'm sure I set this play in France. And there are a few other famous stories that inspired this play and just stories I've heard from friends of friends. It's yes, uh, there surprisingly are, common. There are actual police case. Many, well, the, yes. The, the, we would say, if, and I said to you earlier, it also reminded me of what would be if I, I'd, I'd, when I was 30, I'd married my 24-year-old boyfriend. You know, you think, 
whoa, am I glad I didn't do that. And, but uh, I was talking to someone, well, to, my, to my husband afterwards, at, and we, we were marveling over how beautifully you've constructed this world where this couple are so in love and they communicate seemingly so well. And yet, we find that the level of communication is so different. And my hope is that people watching it say something like what you just said, that there's mm -hmm. some relationship they had where they can relate to it. it is an, a, it's an extreme situation, and it, it has some kind of operatic heights. But hopefully, there's some kind of kernel in it that, um, that is really relatable and recognizable. Oh, I think so. Now, when you say stories it was based on, you mean short stories? or? Oh, stories no, these are stories in the news. You have a wonderful thing that they, in the playbill, you write that you have the chronology of how you created this work. And I'd like you to share that with us because I think it's very interesting about how writers sure. make, make art. So this is the last of um, my, the four plays that I've written to be produced and it's the one that I've started writing first. I started writing it in 2007 when I got a commission from the Yale Repertory Theater. And uh, I wrote a first draft that was, I would call sort of a farce. It was tonally very different from, from this play. I realized it was not successful. I threw it out, I started over. I wrote another draft that I realized was still really widely missing the mark and I started over a third time. So the play that I've written, which is called Belleville, the first draft was called uh, The Doctor's Wife, has not a single line of dialogue in common with that hmm. first draft. And this is very unusual for me. I think usually I get a little closer to the mark my first time out or second time out. So this was really a five year, very laborious, sometimes And you really went to Belleville, you were in Belleville. Yeah, I went there in 2007, it was New Year's, uh, so it was I guess turning 2008 and I, I had been to Paris many times before, but I'd never spent much time in Belleville and was really taken with this neighborhood, which is very vibrant, a lot of immigrant communities, also rapidly gentrifying, but retaining some of its original character. So it's this sort of interesting collision. It speaks so uh, remarkably to me about how we true writers operate, that you can write the whole play and then just throw it away and say, on I go, I'm not there yet. That you, in other words, that you have the, the chops and the discipline to write a whole play and throw it out. Yeah, I don't oh. know that I'd be able to do it again. Yeah. I look back, because every time I thought, I've just failed and this is over. And I mean, I've felt very hopeless about it many times. So I don't know why. But plays I do get abandoned. Out. I mean, some, don't they? I mean, sure. It's the natural writing process. Well, and if I had abandoned this play, I'm sure I would have said, you know, it's a good thing I abandoned that one. It was never going to happen. Yeah. And yet, and but you somehow can't. you were haunted by this story. I was. I was really obsessed with it, and I found it really frightening. And I felt like <laughs> if I could manage to tell the story in a way that was as frightening as I felt about it, then. Yeah, no, and we, we, viewers, this is a thriller, and it's very frightening. I, uh, th will that get more people to come? It's very frightening. I hope so. <laughs> but <laughs> it, no, it's, it's, it's be a it's, movie with Nicole Kidman <laughs> and. The... Uh, it, could, it could very easily be a movie. A uh, very, very, very good movie. Um, now, Amy, there's a lot of uh, chatter around town. Uh, I know a couple of uh, top producers who are very interested in this play. You, you've not had a play on Broadway, correct? No, I haven't. So um, if it moves to Broadway, will it be uh, something very exciting for you? <laughs> or do you want to be a Broadway playwright? Uh, you, have you aspired to be a Broadway playwright? Well, I, I can't say I wrote this play imagining it in a Broadway space. It wasn't uh, directly my goal, but I, of course I'd love to be a, a, a Broadway playwright. I guess that's what I would be if I had a play on Broadway. The money is very nice. Uh, if, I've, if heard <laughs> I've heard he that. He comes up with every corrupting concept <laughs> here for you. Charles Stay Bush. Sure. You, know, you, know Char you know Charles Bush, a fine playwright and actor. Of course. Charles Bush, when he had the tale of the Algis wife, which was off-Broadway Manhattan mm -hmm. Theater Club, they moved it to Broadway, and he was then reading, you know, Charles Bush has gone mainstream, Charles Bush has gone mainstream. And he said, you know, my entire life I was a downtown guy off Broadway, and now I'm mainstream. Am I losing my soul? He said, then he got that first Broadway royalty check. He said, this is mainstream. <laughs> Here I am, darling. Can you make a living then as a playwright doing the, the plays that you're doing in the theaters that you're doing? Uh, you can't count on it. Um, mm -hmm. I No. I mean, I, I've written these four plays. I, I don't have another play after this one, so I have to go back to the drawing board, and I'm sure it'll be a year or two before I go into production again. So, no, the, I think the short answer to your question is no, you have to teach or write movies or something. What do you do? I have taught. I've done both. She taught at Yale. Mm -hmm. She taught at Bryn Mawr. Uh -huh. She does lectures and workshops. That's right. And yeah. I've written, I'm on my second draft of a screenplay. Um, oh, health that's insurance right. comes from doing that, which is a wonderful <laughs> thing I've learned now that I have a child. You started out working for Eric Krebs, a prominent right. off-Broadway producer who owned yeah. the uh, John Houseman Theater. So you always knew you wanted to be in the theater in some way. You know, it's funny. I started working for Eric because I had been on tour as an actor doing a children's play with Theater Works USA. Oh, and, oh I remember that, yeah. And after five months of, um, you know, staying in Super 8s or whatever and, and living out of a van, I uh, sort of... <laughs> 
freaked out and came home and started working for Eric. So I was acting first, then I worked in theater management and gradually found my way. And were you me. always writing during this time, no, too? No, I started writing toward the end of that, that ill-fated Theater Works tour. And, and what, what was the first play? It was a really terrible, and I thought at the time, really good 15-minute play called Granted, which looking back was very much under the influence of F. Scott Fitzgerald and, and earnestly questioning whether it was wrong to be insane. That's what that play So, was. And then you wrote a wonderful play, uh, the two wonderful plays, based on your family, as I said before, who were uh, Marxists. Right. So that was seemed to be a huge influence, their sensibility and, and, and earnest dedication towards their politics. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I grew up in this extended family. We had reunions every year. I knew them all very well, and so I grew up taking it for granted that communism was a pretty normal and um, honorable way of life, not realizing that the rest of yes, the and country then you didn't quite the same way. Question it, <laughs> right? How do right. they feel about Stalin in your family? Uh, well, it depends which generation. The top one, they but, feel um, uh, they 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 are not Stalin apologists. They're not unreconstructed Stalinists, but they don't like to say negative things. That's about what him. after really? the revolution is about, Mister. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 the, the mis misunderstood <laughs> dictator. No, that's don't that think they would go quite that far. But I think <laughs> they feel that there are plenty of people criticizing Stalin, and they don't have to add their voices. No, but and are you are. stop talking? Are you? No, I'm. <laughs> I'm trying to get some stuff. stuff. I'm Relax. trying. Are you a communist? Have you inherited the uh, communist uh, I manifesto? I don't think they've isolated a gene, and I, <laughs> I am not a communist personally. No. No, you're not. Are you to the left, though? Sure. Part of the family, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Not to the left of my family, but to the left generally. No, your family is like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. bring, don't tear down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev. <laughs> That's no, fascinating, but though. Did that you, was that character based on you, the woman who started the foundation? No, she, well, maybe a little bit, mostly two of my cousins who are much more... Uh, who, who had had that crisis of faith? Yeah, well, yeah. no, they hadn't quite... I think the whole family, that's sort of... Um, I mean, there's not really a person in my family who corresponds to Emma who mm -hmm. has that crisis. We all had it in sort of fragmented mm -hmm. ways. So were you sure. a red diaper granddaughter? Kind yes, of? exactly. Red diaper oh, grandbaby, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Well, uh, my last question for you, Amy, is you're married to this very successful director, Sam Gold. Does, do you, does he read your plays first, or is that a terrible sexist question to ask? I don't, it's not sexist. Mm -hmm. um, I, he does tend to read my plays first, yes. And is he critical? Very critical, very supportive, uh, usually very well. Would you ever let him direct one of your plays? We've talked about not doing that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I can see that. <laughs> right now we well, feel the marriage is going well, the careers are going well. So yeah. we'll just leave it at that. So, All right, well, uh, the play is called Belleville at the New York uh, Theater Workshop, uh, getting a lot of good buzz. A uh, thriller, really, quite a scary play. It really unnerved Susan here. Uh, by Amy Herzog, a uh, talented, I was going to say up-and-coming playwright, but when you've got those reviews from Charles Isherwood, I believe you've arrived, darling. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the welcome. Thanks for being our guest. Well, once you're on Theater Talk, then you've really arrived. <laughs> <laughs> the phone will not stop, stop ringing. ringing. There you are. Okay, yeah. welcome. Um, uh, congratulations, and thanks for being our guest on Theater Thank Talk. you both. Thank you. I shouldn't have to explain that to you, because I'm entitled to some privacy. And it has absolutely no bearing in our marriage. Okay. And you shouldn't be so insecure. Or at least, you shouldn't let me see it. <laughs> okay. We are out of the studio today at a watering hole, they used to call it in the old days a watering hole, a theater district bar that is legendary now, called Joe Allen, which Susan has been in existence for 46 years here yes, on West 46 I'm afraid Street. I have too, so I, I'm, <laughs> yes, I'm well yes. aware of it. I've been coming to Joe Allen for, oh God, since I came to New York in college in the 1980s. It's where everybody who works on Broadway yeah. goes and hangs out, they drink, they eat here, and they gossip. And you've been beaten up. You get in the occasional fight here. And we're going to talk to Joe Allen, the man who founded this restaurant in 1965 today. So let's go in. Uh, all right, Joe, this restaurant, the eponymous Joe Allen restaurant, this is your 46th year. Don't, don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, what prompted you to come way west in 1965 when you began the Joe Allen Empire? Well, I, I had a place on the east side prior to that, but the reason I came over here was because I, I saw a market that didn't, uh, that seemed to be room for one more. <laughs> And what was the market that you saw? Well, I saw I, I saw Downey's and Sardi's was they were smoking both of them yeah. the, in the in those days. 
Sardi's was kind of the high end back in those days, where yes. the really fancy Broadway people. Absolutely were. true. And you opened a restaurant that was for kind of the chorus kids, right? For the kids who were. Well, that's who ended up coming here, yeah. Uh, but also, we used to stay open much later than we do now. We stay open until four, mm. which was the legal limit. Vincent Sardi used to come by after he closed his place. He was a very, very nice man, and he was very helpful to me. And he didn't see you as competition when you moved into well, his turf? Well, I guess in some sense is an overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, Jackie Gleason wasn't coming here, and David Merrick wasn't coming here. <laughs> right. uh, How did the chorus kids wind up coming here? What sort of attracted them initially? Well, I was desperate enough that I, I opened up charge accounts for them. They didn't have any money, and you didn't have any money. I didn't have any money, and they didn't, <laughs> yes. But what's interesting about it is, is that there was very, very little loss of non-payment. I mean, fractional, nothing to speak of. This is before credit card. Right, right. There were, there were no credit cards. And, I mean, yes, there was Diners Club. Mm -hmm. American Express, but these kids weren't going to get one of those <laughs> right. under, under any circumstances. But you had a sense of the rhythm of the chorus kids like back then, that they'd have a show and they'd have some money, and then they wouldn't have a show and they wouldn't have any money, but they would still come to Joe Allen. Well, it was, it, it allowed them to, uh, it, it was kind of a finance system for them. Mm. Uh, and like everybody else in the world, you know, some were frugal and some were, you know, very irresponsible. But my losses were really virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. What were the, uh, do you remember what the initial prices were at Joe Allen when you first opened in 1965? What, what would I pay, pay for a hamburger here then? If I'm not mistaken, it was 75 cents. <laughs> well, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What was this neighborhood like when you first opened uh, Joe Allen? What was West 46th Street? What did it look like? What did it feel like? Well, the banks, the banks had redlined everything west of 8th Avenue. Redline meaning they wouldn't lend, just categorically. Drugs were just coming into fashion mm -hmm. in, a, in a rather public way, and 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 where there's drugs, there's crime, and it was it was. Although we never had any customers mug coming to or going from the restaurant. But it was dicey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was very dicey. If you couldn't get a loan from the bank, where did you get the money to open this restaurant? Uh, my accountant at the time had a bunch of other clients, mm -hmm. and he kind of pooled them together and got me the money I needed. What about 11 percent? What was the initial investment in Joe Allen Restaurant? I think it was $90,000. So you opened this for $90,000 yeah. in Yeah, that's right. And then you, but you bought the buildings, right? I mean, one reason that a restaurant like yours can be in business all these years is that you own these two Well, houses Well, the, the two rooms of the restaurant are where I had two separate leases with two separate landlords. And I had them, for the first 10 years, I had them coordinated. And about year five, I said, this isn't going to happen again. Uh, and where we're sitting now, this was owned by Donald Trump's father. Right, right. You know, um, I said, it, it just won't happen again. And I bet I've got to buy these buildings. Well, there was no hope. The <laughs> bank wouldn't lend any money, and, and, and particularly to restaurants. They're very reluctant to lend money to restaurants. So my accountant really saved the day. Um, that was how I was able to, to buy them. What did you pay for these buildings back then? I can't remember which was which, but one was 80000 and one was seventy five. <laughs> Not a bad investment. Yeah, but when you don't have the, the 155, it <laughs> seems like a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. When did you begin? I mean, it's always a struggle opening a restaurant, and it seems to me that you, you, you were sort of hit or touch and go there for a while. When did you really find that you were on firm footing with this restaurant and you could begin to expand with Orso and open restaurants in Well, that came much later, but I would say I was probably five or six years into it here when I felt permanent, mm -hmm. permanence. <laughs> uh, tourism 
at that time in the summer were not coming to the theater. Really? And the theaters, you know, the theaters, it hadn't been that many years that there was air conditioning. Because they used to, shows used to close in the summer. <laughs> and reopen in the fall. Right, right. And so the whole idea of, of summer theater business has, was just beginning to take hold. Tourism started growing, I guess, in the very late 60s, early 70s. But that's when you began to get on a solid footing. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt like I, was, I might be here next year. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about someone who was important in your life, uh, Sherman Billingsley who had the store club. Well, he, he wasn't a, a, a moral leader. No. <laughs> he was a bootlegger, I he believe. He was a bootlegger, yeah. No. How did you come to know him, and what did you learn from him? He used to come and visit me when I had the place on the east side. Right. And he'd come in, and he, was, he couldn't understand that there were all these young people, and nobody had on a necktie. I mean, he was, <laughs> he was from some other age. Right. The time passed him by, just right. totally. Right. Well, he was from that sort of world where, in the store club, where people dressed up in the tuxedos. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, but you were coming along as well, a rest. Opening nights, everybody was in black tie. Right, 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 right. But, yeah. but when you were coming along with this restaurant, it was a, a more of an informality coming into... Well, yes. That, 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 that was... I mean, my, my first place, and to a great extent this place, was... The, the the model was P. J. Clark's. Right, right. And that Which is was, where you're, where and you're that going. was you know, society slumming, <laughs> I guess you'd call it. That kind of informality was 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 what was coming on. A lot of celebrities come to your place. Um, who was the? Do you remember the first group of famous people who started coming to Joe Allen? Well, it was performers. Yeah, it was people in shows. And your friend Sheeta Rivera, she she was, was she an early uh, customer as well? Not that early, not that early. Elaine Stritch was she used to go there. Oh yeah, when she was still drinking. <laughs> there must have been some interesting nights with Elaine here. <laughs> yeah, at, well, uh... <laughs> yes. She brings her own fun with her. Uh, <laughs> she could go all night long, I would imagine. And I remember one night it was all. You know, it was after the show, and it was all merriment and people laughing and playing. And David Merrick walked in the door, and the whole room froze. <laughs> and no one would raise their voice after that <laughs> until he left. Oh, really? <laughs> That's the kind of terror he inspired. Well, he, yeah. Him. I mean, he he was frightening in that particular. If you're, you know, if you're working for him, or might work for him, mm -hmm. or want to work for him. Today, there are no producers in the sense that there were. There was one producer, and you know, if, if the show won the Tony, the one producer would get a. Now it's a small village. <laughs> right. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Goes to get Good the, for your business, though, too. If they have a luncheon meeting, there right, are, well, instead of four of them, there are 20 of them. <laughs> that's right, right. <laughs> Somebody said that to me that you always had this saying about you know, sort of your philosophy of uh, how you treat customers that the, um, the person who cares where they sit. Oh, it's Doesn't about it? seating, yes. Yeah, yeah. Explain yeah, your yeah. theory it's a of, very of seating. It's a very simple, those that care don't count, and those that count don't care. <laughs> so, so, in other words, all the celebrities who come in here, you don't put up with the people who demand this table and want to be well, here. Well, they, 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 we do what we can to accommodate them, but, yeah, you, there's only so much you can do. Believe it or not, there are still people who come in and say, do you know who I am? <laughs> I mean, it's always astounding <laughs> that anyone could utter those words. <laughs> and uh, what's your reaction to someone who comes in and says, do well, you know who I am? Well, you, no, there is no reaction. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's... <laughs> Over the years, who, um, I remember hearing there was a producer, Garth Drabinsky, who uh, is under indictment and can't come down to America now because he right. bankrupted his company. And I'd always heard that he was possibly the most difficult Joe Allen customer. He was one of these he was a He was a pain in the ass, yes. <laughs> uh, it, uh, and it was about nothing. You know, it was just petty little one-upsmanship that, that uh, yeah, he got his 
hand caught in the cookie jar. Have you ever banned anyone from Joe Allen's? Is there anyone that you said you can't come in here anymore? Uh, yeah, but I can't remember his name. Is it that? One or two. Yeah. Along the way. And what would what would be cause for being banned from uh, Joe Allen's? Well, improper behavior, <laughs> Take, you know, taken too far. <laughs> That's right. I mean, it's, bars are based on improper behavior, but <laughs> you know, there's, there's a line. <laughs> What's the secret to longevity in the restaurant business? Paying attention. Yeah. That's all. To customers. Just to paying attention. It just, just. I don't think they'd admit it, but I think a lot of guys go into this business to meet girls. <laughs> and if that's what you're doing, that's not paying attention. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> you can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can follow us on Twitter. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. <laughs>